please start, I would like to talk to you about our project. A new discourse dialogue is what we work on. Hranting Foundation, uh, Community Volunteers Foundation, Sabanji University, they all work in collaboration within the scope of this project. We are tackling the discriminatory uh, and hatred discourse encountered by refugees in Turkey. In this panel, we are going to talk about the dimension of media and how they victimize refugees and what kind of alternative approaches we can adopt in order to fight against that. So let me first of all introduce our guests, our panelists. First of all, from London, we have the photographer Karpis Latigra from London, as I said. His career started at the indep independent journal. He started as a photographer. Uh, he worked for different uh, newspapers as an in uh, independent photographer, but then he started working for magazines and he started carrying out long-term projects. He won the uh, World Press Photo Award in 2018. Uh, his portrait photo uh, photographs are uh, quite striking for me. In the panel, he is going to give us more detailed information about all his work. So before, without further ado, I would like to introduce our second guest to you, our second panelist, panelist to you. Sabit Saadi is an artist that learned about photography uh, by himself. He moved to Mardin and worked for various NGOs. He is a photographer, but in addition to this, he is responsible for the darkroom project of Sikane. Within the scope of this project, he carries out workshops with children, uh, Syrian children in Mardin. Here is what he said in an interview. Everybody expects photographs to be about suffering, uh, but the results are quite uh, joyful, actually. His photos are being exhibited in Canyon Culture. If you're interested, you can go see that exhibition. And lastly, Gamze Toksoy. Gamze Toksoy is an academic at Mimar Sinan Fine Arts Academy, uh, Collective uh, Memory, uh, Social Sciences, uh, sciences uh, Gender are the issues on which she made research. And finally, Uh, she is also working on a discriminatory discourse. So, after this brief introduction, I would like to give the floor to uh, Gamze Toksoy, and I will mute myself. Thank you very much, Erçin. Before we start, I would like to thank Granting Foundation for their contributions to our uh, hot issues. I wish every one of you a good evening. I hope that this uh, dialogue, this conversation will be fruitful and will be horizon opening for us. I would like to thank the project team as well, because they are trying to come up with creative methods, alternative approaches, and this is an important need for all of us. We need this more than ever, actually. Today, we are going to talk about picturing refugees. We are going to discuss images related to refugees. As Elchin said, I'm going to try to put forward uh, a general framework, and then I am going to give the floor to our panelists, to our photographers. With my PhD students, Denise Ebeck and Berna Aktuan, we uh, carried out a piece of research about the visual image of refugees beyond the frame uh, we called this work, we called this piece of research. And in this research, first of all, we looked at the visual representations of refugees and how we should discuss this, uh, from what aspects. So visual representation sometimes used discriminatory uh, and excluding approaches. And we uh, try to draw attention to this aspect of such work. And when we uh, conducted this research, we saw some photos, some images that are widely used in the media. 
we see certain patterns uh, that are constantly used by the media. So what do these images offer to us? Uh, masses of people uh, that are not subjectivized. They are victimized. We see women and children, they're suffering on their face. Uh, we create bodies that need our help. They become anonymous. Uh, the loss is minimized to physical loss, actually. And there is no detail. There is no detail as to why this has come to pass. The images, they need to help us uh, get detailed information about what is going on, but this is not how they are used. Of course, this framework benefits from the marketing strategies uh, that are widely used. When we start discussing the policy of this framework, we see how the disadvantaged groups are considered. They are considered as if they do not have any means to represent themselves. This is themselves. This is how we assume them. So we uh, give ourselves the right to speak on behalf of them. The pity feelings that we see on the media, victimizing them. So the opinion behind this is that they cannot represent themselves. So there is this hierarchical uh, point of view, hierarchical perspective. This is how we assume in the first place. But we do not question why they do not have the right to represent themselves. We uh, put forward certain reasons as if we are trying to make their problems uh, more visible. And this is what we see everywhere on the newspapers, on the social media. And this is not only related to the mainstream media. Today, when we look at various institutions that work on refugees that come up with supportive policies, we see that they suffer from the same problem. Uh, when we conducted our research, we looked at NGOs who worked in this field. Uh, they produce uh, banners or bulletins, they make publications, and we see that there too, there are similar problems. They repeat the same problems, actually. And the academic uh, studies, they also have similar photos. This is what we have observed. So in that case, when we criticize these images, we try to point out that there is this perspective regime in the community, this perspective towards various groups, disadvantaged groups. So in images, uh, the bodies of refugees, they are objectified in a way. This is what we're trying to draw people's attention to. Refugees where they migrate, they are subjected to uh, such attitudes. And these images uh, play, in a role, uh, in play a role in creating such uh, discriminatory approaches. Because unfortunately, in these visuals, refugees' efforts to recreate their lives are not visible. And we see that refugees are limited to being a part of a social problem, not a part of a, a part of a solution. So we are encountered with such frameworks. There is this visual agreement uh, in the media. So in order to break this, uh, there, uh, I mean, there is a need to break this. We no longer need to be uh, watchers, audience. We need to go beyond the feelings of pity or empathy. Uh, we try to enlarge their space to exist. What kind of methods can we use to do that? We need to focus on this. We have two photographers, our guests. When I look at their work, uh, 
they lo work with people who do not have means to represent themselves, who do not have cameras, who do not have studios, even for their portraits, they do not go to a facility. So they work with people whose opinion uh, is not demanded, is not requested, who do not have, who do not uh, have a say on their own, uh, on their own life. Their opinion is not asked, is not demanded, and they do not have any say in their visual representation. What kind of different facilities can we offer to such people? I believe our photographers have asked some questions and I believe their research is quite striking. So I would like to give the floor to Serbest Salih and Kalpesh Latirga now. What can you, uh, I mean, you defend alternative approaches about the representation of refugees and this is how you generate your work. So what kind of criticism do you have about the mainstream representation of refugees? How do you approach this issue? What's your opinion on that? And then uh, could you give us some information about alternative methods that you think should be used? What kind of methods have you focused on in your projects? What did you aim? What kind of obstacles have you encountered? And how uh, did this process affect you? So I'm going to give the floor to you now, and then maybe we can detail this even further, uh, thanks to the questions that we'll receive. Once again, thank you for your participation. Elson, do you want me to go first? Yes, it's fine. Uh -huh. Yes, please. Perfect. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for inviting me. I feel pretty honored to be able to talk to all of you. And thank you to the team to uh, organize this for me. Um, uh, I think, really, I'll, I'll give you a bit of history first. So when I first started taking photographs, I was a press photographer, a news photographer. And I was meant to be unbiased and shoot the idea of truth in front of me. And there was a kind of, I guess, a Western mythology about photojournalism, about how you would go to countries that were developing, let's say in countries in Africa or the subcontinent in India, and how you would visualize or photograph those communities. And it was very much this idea of parachuting in to a, into a place, like let's say there was a famine somewhere and you'd photograph it and you'd show this suffering and then you would go back and publish the work. Now, there was two things in play there. One was the ego of the photographer, this idea of winning awards and this romanticized vision of making a difference. And that was the kind of like, I, I'm doing these pictures because I wanna give these people a voice, but really it was more about the ego and taking these pictures, publishing them and kind of showing a very distinct view of people who were, who had no voice really. To, and a photographer was trying to give them this voice, but really they weren't. And I was part of this same a trajectory of, of, of photographers. Um, what happened to me that what changed me was one day during the Kosovan war, uh, I, was, uh, I was in the newspaper's offices and um, there was a few of us photographers who saw a picture come on the screen and it was some refugees who were going on a bus. And as the bus went by, there were 10 photographers all photographing the same image. And I looked at it and I thought to myself, what is the point of even that? Uh, what are you even trying to say here? And it started making me think about how I represented people. And I was working with NGOs as well. You know, I, would, I worked with the UN ones or Save the Children or whoever. And even then in those days, we're talking 10 years ago, there was the idea that they were going in and you take these photographs of, I guess, people looking sad, people needing help because those images would raise funds and money for the NGOs. Now, since then, uh, some NGOs now are changing the way 
they are asking photographers who are on the ground there how they photograph. Also the idea of consent. 10 years ago, consent didn't even exist. The idea of asking to take a photograph uh, of somebody who has gone through some trauma. You just go there, take a picture and walk away. So consent is there now. Um, I think that the, this is, the, and the, this is the, where the contradictions and the difficulties arise. If you're a news photographer and you are covering a news situation ongoing, how do you photograph something that's developing in front of you? That could be people suffering, could be people arriving, people trying to save themselves on a, on a, on a boat or something, and you're photographing this. And how, the, and how are those images then used? Who's using those images? In which newspapers or magazines and how are they portraying those? So the photographer themselves as an individual may be feeling that, oh, okay, I'll take these pictures because I want to make a difference. And they also might be taking these pictures because they have to take these pictures because they need it to economically survive. They may be a staff photographer or they're earning a living from what they're doing. But ultimately, those images then get used in, let's say, a right-wing newspaper for a very particular way of portraying them. So over here in London, we have a newspaper called a Daily Mail. And the Daily Mail is prolific in its... Uh, demonization of people seeking refuge constantly. There's never been no change in that. Um, to the extent that I told them to people who represent me, do not sell images to this paper because I don't want to be touched by that. Um, so we're left with that, that scenario. For, for me, I, you know, my, my thing was this, that um, how do I try to make the public view and look at photographs in a different way and try to actually learn about what is actually happening. And actually maybe disrupt, disrupt the, the way of thinking, the kind of the, the prejudice around looking at people who are seeking refuge and look at them as human beings and look at them at, you know, actually as who they are and try to understand that they literally are the same as you. Um, I think one of the most interesting things for me was I think specifically with the Syrian uh, crisis was when I went to Zatari uh, camp in Jordan, um, there was so much anger from Syrians who were living there at the conditions. And, I, and that was a real wake up call because it made me understand that actually this idea of victimization, you, the, the Syrians, the, the, the kind of the, their lifestyle in Damascus or elsewhere was the same and they had been put into a refugee camp and expected to just live and just be and accept it. And so it made me really think about how I approach this. And so how do I approach this? Well, the these are the difficulties I face. One is how do you get a commission from, a, from an agency or a magazine or somebody to pay for you to go and make this work first under circumstances of your storytelling processes? Um, you either have a very compassionate or understanding photo director who says, okay, I, can, I understand the idea. Or you go to an NGO and say, maybe they'll, they'll agree with it. For me, the difficulty was with, with Zatari, I had to go there to get access, photographing a celebrity who is going there from America to raise awareness on the crisis. Now, I have to balance the fact I'm going there, I'm getting access. I shoot the rubbish. And then I say to myself, okay, how do I make my work there for a week or two longer to actually make this count? What am I trying to say? And um, I had to negotiate it that way early, in the early days of how I was working this way. And then uh, we managed to get funding uh, from, from a technical tech company called VSCO. And, um, I explained my idea um, regarding the idea of passport photographs and um, studio portraits. So I, my research involved uh, looking at the Armenian uh, studios from the past that were run across the Middle East. And I looked at how th those photographers would 
would bring families into in, into the studio with, with, with the kind of with the backdrops of the mountains or the rivers or the seas and and it'd be this kind of beautiful kind of family portrait and I thought that's an amazing kind of way of empowering the community to come there themselves in their in, in their in their in how they want to see themselves in their best clothes to have a record of their life um even though they are in Istanbul and um so we um I spoke to a a, a, a a man an artist who was who owned a bookshop in Istanbul and it, the book the bookshop was actually a, a a center for for Iraqis Syrians to come there it's called pages uh, and he, he agreed to build a studio in the top floor and so we invited everybody to come there and we made this work of the of the, of the studio portraits but then alongside that I decided to think about well what else can I do in terms of my opinion about you know how data is used in in, in the act what how how people can access services and passports or identity documents so we set up a passport studio as well what I did was I took what I call data from the, from the camera and brought it back to the United Kingdom and I went to the local high street and we uh we put it through their passport maker to make them, make them biometrically like a UK passport. So the use of data saying these are just, you know, these have been set to a UK passport. And then I made collages. Now the reason of the collages is really, um, it's an enticement. They look pretty on the wall. If, it, if they're in a gallery or published in a magazine, somebody will go, wow, look at this collage. And as they get closer, they see they are people. And they're repeating patterns of data, of it, and it's really a, it's really a visual trick to make people to understand that look, these are human beings. This is this passport picture, this identity photograph, is is, is sometimes gives them access. So in let's say Zatari, in the old days there was an identity document with paper, but now it's all biometrics. So I wanted to talk about this alongside the studio portraits. Um, after some NGO saw this work. Um, Oxfam took me to Sicily to do the to people who are arriving in Sicily and in Sicily it was very very different um, I couldn't photograph the young men there because you couldn't show their identity but the most beautiful thing happened they showed me some models they were making of houses of churches in in Sicily of their homes in in Ivory Coast or in Ghana and one young man made a model of his dream house. And they learn all of this off the internet, off YouTube. So I photographed the models, just the models, because I thought they symbolize something unique and beautiful about, you know, this idea of creativity among young men, you know, and you know what they what their hopes and dreams are, just as everybody else. So, you know, for me, the the the, the idea of how we how we how we picture inadvertent commas people seeking refuge. Um, is, is a constant battle for me. It's, it's evolving. You know, it's a constant thing. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, the idea is of victimization is always at the forefront of my mind. You know, how, how can I empower them to tell their own stories at the same time? How can I author it for myself as well for myself to understand? Um, because, you know, I'm, I'm acutely aware you know, you know, in the you know in the UK with Brexit, you know what happened with with, with the imagery that was used, with, with with you know the idea of refugees and Turk. So we were completely aware. And also, you know, I've grown up with this. I've, I've you know, my parents were immigrants here. My wife was a refugee. So um, you become acutely aware to how the idea of one is of the this kind of idea of looking after people. Which is quite patronizing in many ways of being the savior, the white savior idea. And then you also have a very distinct pattern about how the media operate. You know, these young men are coming here, these refugees are going to take our jobs, etc., etc., etc. In the same way they have a have the same technique for immigrants, which they kind of blow up and it's it's, it's always the idea of the other. And generally, it's always the other, which is of, of, of brown skin rather than of white skin. But I mean, saying that, they also use the same techniques for Eastern Europeans here as well. So, you know, it depends on which side of the, 
border you're on here. Um, but for me, it's just really about uh, constantly challenging. So I would say like my next um, process is I want to work with, uh, with, 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 with the Rohingya community in Bangladesh. And now we're, in, we're, we're over here in COVID, nobody can travel, but now I think to myself, well, maybe I can commission a photographer, an artist in Bangladesh to make the work to send over the passport pictures. And then I, I will then uh, use those and make them take their own photographs. So it's a constant, it's a constant evolution for me. I hope that explains something. Thank you. I can't hear anybody. Uh, Gamze, can you please unmute yourself? Uh, I don't think she's heard you. Gamze, you gotta un unmute yourself. I guess uh, her mic has been unmuted now. Yeah, yeah. No, Sarbest has unmuted his mic. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. All right. Hello. Can you please speak up? Let me try and put on my headphones again. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you, and my mic has been unmuted as well, so I think we can all hear each other. Please, go ahead. Hello. Thank you very much. Sarbes Sali is my name. I am a refugee as well. I came to Turkey after 2014. Actually, Um, we have been questioning. Uh, we beg your pardon, but can you please ask the speaker to take off the um, headset because we cannot hear him. It's it's much worse when he put on the headset. Let's try again. Much better. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you. So I was a refugee as well myself. Um, so I have been focusing on refugees' issues, and refugees are always victimized, seen as people who need things. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. I do not hear anything. Can we can, uh, can we ask the speaker to choose Turkish, please?
Elçin. Yes, I'm trying to contact him, but I think he just got disconnected. Yes, uh, so until he gets connected, let us continue. Kalpesh Latigra, can you hear me right now? Yes, I can hear you. So maybe you can um, tell us about your project uh, until Salih gets back. This drew yeah. my attention, uh, okay. making a series of passport photography. And uh, I think you have an article about that, which I read. So can you please talk us about that as well? How did you bring that project together? Thank you. Sure. Um, so originally what happened was I was in, in, in Zatari in, in Jordan and I took with me a, a, a old fashioned passport camera. So once we'd actually were like the old ones. Would, and I started making some portraits there whilst I was working on, on, on for, for the NGO. And um, when, I, when, I, when I looked at them, I thought this is really interesting because this is the idea of the one democratic portrait that everybody needs, you know, whether driving license or passport or whatever. And so I started thinking about, well, what does this, what, 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 would, what would give this access to? Would this let me get to the UK or cross the border? Or will it get me food or whatever? And so when I got back to London, um, I showed them to some friends who were both American photographers. And they told me that they were, raised, they, they were trying to get some money raised or capital raised from uh, this uh, tech company called VSCO. They, were, they made, uh, you know, filters for cameras for your phone. And they were supporting journalists or artists and they, they my friends put in an application so they proposed that I uh, do a project along this line and I said to him I didn't want to go back to Zatari and I said I wanted to come to Istanbul because one of the kind of big I guess fallacies over here is that the the, the Middle East doesn't do enough for for people seeking refuge and I knew that Turkey had taken on so many people to come there and kind of given them refuge. So I thought, let's go there. And then I'd done the research and I found, I found my friend at Page's bookshop and um, contacted him. And he was, a, he was an artist himself. And um, I, came, I came to Istanbul to do a, a recce, you know, to come and meet people and actually feel, could I work with people and introduce myself to the community there? So I spent a week every day at the at, at the bookshop in the cafe there and i spoke to lots of uh, young young people from syria and young people from iraq and um they told me about the poetry from syria and i thought okay so this is amazing and then i spoke to my friend uh, who who like i said his father was a photographer in, in damascus he had, oh, had a very big studio there and uh, and Hare, his name is Hare Sarkozy, and he, he's an artist. And he he done a book looking at all the back backdrops, uh, you know, in studios uh, across uh, the Middle East. And I was like, this is amazing. And I said, uh, you know, it gave. It's I done the research. I started looking at the influence of the studio in the Middle East for families and for individuals to go there. So that was like, okay, so I can I I can combine these two projects because. On the one hand, we are we are empowering the people to to show the, how they want to be seen, and uh, for my side of the project was uh, how do we talk about the ideas of what data and um, this one portrait can do? And then, obviously, the thing that the thing I was thinking about with, with, with the portraits of the passports was was along the idea of well, how do you make them visually enticing? Because it's a very straight portrait, so I started playing with the kind of the idea of these collages, and you know these old. I don't know if you ever saw these uh, these these kind of magical pictures that you have to stare at for a very long time, and then you see something. So I thought maybe that's the idea. So then I started making these collages, and um, what was very interesting was people's reaction to it more than anything, because it because it was a it, it was a visual play, a toy, or you know a trick. 
to make them kind of be sucked into it and think to themselves, oh, that's a very interesting picture. But when they get closer and then they have to think and then they understand that what these actual portraits are about, it makes them for me to think a lot more about the, 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 what, what, how people are represented. Now, the reason I think about these things in parts of the project is that because I came from a photojournalism background, in the, in, in, when, when, when the magazines from the 70s and 80s were showing, let's say, pictures from Africa or from famines or wherever, other crises, I think there was a, what they call a, a numbing. You know, people stopped looking at the photographs. They just went over them, over them, over them and thought, oh, just another, just somebody else having a family, just another refugee or these people are like this. So I wanted to challenge that, the idea, how can you make people stop maybe trick them even into looking at these photographs and thinking, oh, actually this is like, and so this is why the project has been ongoing. And, you know, the, the passport pictures are an integral part because I think, because more about technology and about data, I think what data means and what, what access it gives you. Alongside that, I'm trying to then thread narratives of these other moments that are through the project, whether it's the, whether it's these houses that are made or whether it's people living underneath an underpass. But when I take those sorts of photographs, I have a very neutral pose. So I don't use, so, you know, the, the, I think the problem with cameras today is that you can stick on a wide angle lens and you can compose the picture to be look very powerful because it's visually powerful, but actually there's no depth to it. It's all about the bells and whistles, you know, just the, how it looks rather than the, the, the thing what's behind it. And so by taking a very neutral pose, when I take a photograph like this, it actually, makes people just look straight on in those images. And you'll see that if you look at my work that, you know, really, I, I, I don't like to have this kind of idea of having a glamorization of a wide angle lens and a hand stick in here or face over here and cre creating a very particular uh, expression on someone's face to, you know, to, get, get, to, to pretend you're getting an emotional re reaction to it. Does that make sense what I'm saying? So having that neutral pose, just trying to photograph that way allows the thread to flow through the photographs. I don't know if that. Thank you very much. This sounds terribly exciting. And by the way, Sarbe Sari is with us. Uh, we will uh, continue um, later on, but let me hand over the floor to Sari if he's uh, fixed this technical problem. Can you hear us now? Yes, I can. Apologies uh, for my disconnection. Um, that's all right. Please go ahead. We can't see you right now, though. Now, um, my connection is weak, so that's why I wanted to uh, turn off the um, camera. Can you please repeat the question? Um, we wanted to hear more from you. Um, so please, can you tell us about um, your project? how refugees are depicted in the media, what you would like to say about this, what your criticism is, and then can you also tell us about the Darkroom uh, project, how you brought that together? We would be happy to um, hear more details and uh, hear about the challenges that you went through and what you wanted to achieve. Uh, so we would very much um, like to hear from you on these points. Thank you. Sure. Now. In 2014, I was in Kobani. I, I came to Turkey as a as a refugee, and the general approach around the world uh, is that refugees are always depicted as victims. They're looked down upon, and that's the picture you get. There's a discriminatory language, and visually as well, there's a lot of discrimination going on. And actually, in order to confront this, we wanted to. We wanted to reach out to Syrian children and we wanted to uh, depict them through their own lens. And we wanted people to see them for who they are. That's why we devised this project. And what are the challenges that we're going through? Well, by and large, I would say that, can you please repeat the question, says the speaker. During the project, what sorts of challenges did you go through? and? How did you overcome these problems was my question. I'm 
curious to know how children represented themselves and how you uh, provided oversight and then how uh, were you influenced by this project as a photographer? Well, here are the challenges that we went through normally at the workshop, we get all these sorts of questions like, um, it, it, I mean, people talk about warfare all the time and um, the speaker has stopped talking. Can you actually hear us or are you disconnected again? Until he comes back, perhaps uh, we can talk about, um, well, previously we said that the visuals that we see in the media um, are, are objectifying refugees, but th this objectification um, is about these people who are fleeing war, who are um, traveling in groups, uh, on boats, and so on and so forth. Um, these close shots, um, sorrowful faces, or masses of people going from one place to another, um, and most probably uh, people depicted as dangerous because these people are masses, they will come and they will confiscate our homes. Uh, that is the image that is uh, constructed. But um, what Sabe Salin did uh, in his dark darkroom project, I think the key difference is that uh, the photographer, um, just like Karl Pesch has said, uh, gives up on his or her ego and turns the camera to people who are actually going through this. Uh, so this is what darkroom also wanted to wanted to do. Um, so what you're going through and you know how do you live your daily lives is the is what is depicted in these pictures because these questions get never asked i mean we imagine big crowds and masses of people but actually these are individuals who are mourning who are trying to reorganize their lives and um and um uh, fighting to do that so that background uh, gets lost and um that's why this is so important so how do their day-to-day -day lives go about? What do kids do? And how do they manifest themselves? And Sabes Salim also talked about that. Um, so uh, we always talk about warfare and negative things, uh, but actually children are going about their lives and they want to show their creativity. So, they want to shoot the frames where they feel good about themselves. So seeing this difference, it is beyond pointing to the living conditions of refugees, but visualizing their efforts to reorganize their lives. This is how I approach the issue, how I see it. Is Sarbest Sari back here? I'm in contact with him at this moment. He doesn't have internet connection. The mobile phone is not working either. Hotspot is not working either. We cannot access him at this moment. So if you like, we can receive questions at the same time uh, while we are trying to connect to him, if it's possible. Well, his mobile is not working either, but I will keep trying. If you like, you can proceed with the questions. 
Okay, let's proceed with questions because I think that we lost some time because of connection problems. It will be very saddening if we cannot uh, have him join this conversation, but we need to keep going with the questions, I guess. Okay, now I'm going to turn to our audience to see if they have any questions. If we can connect to Sarvis Sali, uh, we are going to give him the floor right away. But if you have any comments, any questions, please shoot. I am reading your questions now, waiting for your questions. Neil Kaya has a question. Okay. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hello. Thank you very much. First of all, uh, I would like to thank our panelists. My question is for Kalpesh Latirga. I uh, think he talked about how he worked in 70s and 80s, how he visualized similar conditions back then, analog experience and digital experience. What's the difference between the two? You said that the depth of photographs are different now. There is a difference there. So do you think digital experience accelerated the negative effects there? The fact that we can take more photos now, does it cause us to think less about the uh, photos that we take actually? I am curious about your opinions there. Thank you very much. You... I believe you got the question, okay, Karpash. I got the question. Yeah, so hi, Anil. Uh, thank you so much uh, for that amazing question. Um, so, I was going to correct you a little bit. I, I, I looked at magazines from the 70s. I was born in the 70s, so I'm not that old. But um, what I was going to say was that in those days, and even, I guess, up to the 90s, I was still shooting, and I still shoot film as well today. Um, but certainly, I think the time factor made a difference uh, in terms of the publication of those images that were coming through. Um, but I also think that, the the questions weren't being asked or empowering other communities that were being photographed so you had western photographers going into areas that were either suffering or had war or famine or and they'd go there and provide the news and uh before television but it it, it, it was this idea of parachuting in and you know uh so and those those questions weren't being asked by by people at that time about representation or of, of of the people um, because I think partly to do with the idea wide idea of kind of a supremacy you know the idea that you can go there this is I, I'm allowed to be here and take these photographs and I'm doing this for the good of mankind but um. Moving towards what you're talking about the, in a digital age, certainly, again, that's twofold. One is that I think initially, as digital became more and more popular, the transmission of images became faster. And um, so uh, information was passed very, very quickly and it could be dis disseminated very, very quickly uh, and used whether in the right way or for propaganda, because it was so fast. And then if you move even now faster uh, to the idea of the kind of cell phone, now you're, you're, you're stuck in between these two worlds whereby on the one hand, it can be very, very empowering because it has empowered a lot of people to be able to have a voice, really have a voice and have a platform outside of the mainstream media. And at the same time, we have the problem of, I guess, visual overload. So you are constantly, let's say you're going on your Instagram and you're constantly just looking at your, 
and you're 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 being blanketed by it. You, you you're not disseminating it anymore so we have that problem alongside it but at the same time you know i i saw very recently that the there were some young photographers in Bangladesh in, who are in, in, the Rohing, in, in the Rohingya community who are making the work and, and, and documenting the life there themselves. The, the, the issue really, really remains is where is this work going to be published and shown and who, who decides what pictures are the good pictures in their mind? And that's the problem because I think that, you know, uh, whether it's digital or analog, um, is really not the issue anymore. I think really the, the, the issue has always remained um, who holds the power, who, who actually puts out the image. So you can, yeah. it's very, very difficult. I think there's a romantic notion of film still now as well. That's the other thing, you know, if you shoot film, it's, like, it's a romance around it. Um, uh, but it doesn't get to the issue of, you know, like I said, the issue of who, who, who holds the power, who, who are the gatekeepers allowing this? And so you're, you have that to deal with. And, you know, how do we, if we are shooting digitally, how can we hold people's attention within this? You know, how do we make people's voices be heard and authored in, for themselves? Um, I don't know, Neil. I mean, it's, it's a difficult one. I mean, I, I, I photograph using both mediums. I, you know, I just, I'll be honest with you, look, I just, I'll show you. I just got this thing, which is a, you know, it's a, it's a medium format digital camera. And I'm working with that because it allows me to work in a very particular way. Um, but it also saves me money. So if I, so do, so if I want to go and take, do a project somewhere, I, I can afford to do it and be in control of it without having to rely on the mainstream media to publish it. I can do it in, I, I can fund it myself in a particular way and then I can disseminate it and show it to people and, and have it output where I want it to be shown. You know, um, like if, if, if you go to my website, you will never see the pictures I've done for UNICEF or for the United Nations, the UNHCR, which was the ones that were expected to be done, shown because they're just, they, they're just for me, they're nonsense. And, 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 and you know, I don't get commissioned no more by them because the, I don't produce that style of photography anymore. And, and I think that's the other problem. I think if you, have, if you have a photographer who needs to fund work or make a living, pay the bills, he or she might go and take a job because they can do the work because they can take the photographs, but it doesn't actually get to the, how the photograph he or she may want to take. For me now, I've taken a decision whereby I, do, I won't photograph those things that I expected which means I lose, I lose work, but I can look at myself in the mirror at night that I know how I'm making these images. Um, and, you know, it's about really, for me, re-educating the NGOs who are in these places about how we are reading these photographs. And, and, and some of them are doing it. I spoke to the Red Cross in, in, in the UK recently, and uh, they are, they, they're actively trying to change stuff. It saved the children, Again, now they, 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 there are discussions about how this visual imagery is made. Um, I think the bigger problem is really the, the media, the, the main that what we talk about, the, and you know where they are used. And even if you look at the Guardian, which is a, you know is like a, is a liberal newspaper, it still has imagery which performs. And I say that really it performs. It's, it's a performance. Look, these people are coming on a boat. We must photograph them. Look, these people are coming to the country again. And it plays into these narratives, you know, economics. I put it down to that, you know, it, it's about it's about making 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 the dollar. So, why is it that the 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 worst paper, in my opinion, in this country in, in the UK, does very very well financially because it plays to every single trope around refugees uh, quite happily, and and people love it. The people buy into it, and you know it. It, 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 it performs what it's meant to do, what they want it to do, you know? Sorry, Neil, I may have gone off on a tangent there. Thank you very much.
let me give you some information about the situation of Sarbet uh, Salih. He's trying to find some, some place with reliable internet connection, but there is a general uh, electricity problem in his region. So let's keep going. Okay. Which newspaper are you talking about, Kalpash? I see that question, but he yeah. said it was Guardian. No, 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 no. It's too, it's, um, no, no. The, the, the one that I, there's two, I mean, this is, it's interesting. The question is very, very interesting because I, I can, um, there's, if we look at the right wing press here, like the Daily Mail or the Sun, you know, these are very, very populist papers. They always have been. And the Daily Mail here is, is one of the worst. Um, they, they have these headlines that are pretty much 95% against refugees or people seeking refuge or immigrants or you know anybody who is the other and it's and it's, and it's very much um the visual imagery that they use always plays to this idea where it's like young men let's say young men in germany syrians in germany young Syrian, or so they, they play on this idea of these men are going to come here and take our women and they're going to take our jobs and they're going to be violent, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, or they might go to, let's say, Dover in Kent over here and they'll say, these English, English men are, are volunteering to uh, look out for migrants crossing the channel. Yeah. So they make a bravado about this. Uh, and the images they use are there. What they will also do is they'll have 5% where they'll put in some positive stories to say they're not racist or uh, they're not doing anything wrong. Now, The Guardian is a left-wing liberal paper. Um, and most of their coverage is, I guess, fair in, when, in the writing, in when they, when they write, write, write uh, about the situation concerning Syria or uh, elsewhere. However, when we talk about news imagery, the news, the, the news photograph, that's where the contradiction comes in. How do you stop a news photographer showing what's going on? How can you not visualize it? It's there in the news. Um, and how many projects or stories will they run which are long form? So they might run maybe two projects a year, maybe three if you're lucky, about a photographer or an artist working in a particular way. And if you're a, if you're an artist, I say you're uh, Al, uh, Ai Weiwei, you know, if you're Weiwei, uh, the Chinese artist, and he's done something, he'll have a vocal voice that he can say, well, this is the work I'm making. And you might have that for one year, but you won't have other people who are doing other work. Um, and I think also, like I was saying, the, the other thing is that we have to stop this romanticization of the visual image, how, how somebody is photographed, because when we talk, when, when, what Nil was saying was quite interesting about, about digital technology is that you can make a great photograph, and I say this as a great photograph visually, but it doesn't mean anything. It, all it does is provide like a, a nice picture of the wall that says, look, this composition is correct, and you have this person who's suffering. And this goes down to art history as well. You know, if you look at the paintings and from, from, the, from centuries ago, and you have pictures of people suffering, they're very visually uh, enticing. So you, 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 you have a photograph, and the photograph is on steroids now, where you can enhance the colors, you can enhance everything and look, make it look so extreme and um, through digital technology and go, wow, you know, here you go. Alongside this, we had the problem of manipulation of imagery, you know, where Photoshop is used. Uh, so, I mean, I think, I think we, we, we are partly stuck with the idea of the media, but I think alongside that, we have to challenge it by trying to make platforms ourselves, um, whether that is self-publishing even, you know, even, it's even having self-publishing platforms with zines, even by using, if you can use social media in a, in a, in a particular way, um, those, those, those uh, imageries can be put out there. Um, it's about really empowering ourselves, really, um, against this idea that there can only be one one version of event, events out there. Because that's the, that I would say that's the positivity of technology. That that today, if if I wanted to go print a hundred newspapers, I could do that at a reasonable cost, 
and I can put a, a, a different set of pictures out there, uh, myself out there. And it's also about convincing and talking to partners who are interested in these, in, in these uh, new ways of looking. And, you know, I would say, really, we're at that time now, this year has proved to be quite uh, essential in how we can approach other partners outside of the mainstream media, uh, how we do it. I mean, I don't know if you saw here, the BBC were doing a live broadcast of people crossing the channel and trying to talk to them and, and people were suffering and the reporter was like not doing anything. And so, you know, they, they were pulled up on this, you know? I've gone off on a tangent again. Sure. Mm -hmm. Oh, what, what did they do? Okay, so um, what happened was recently, we, you know, we have had some people trying to come via a, a, a small boat in a, a channel. Now, the BBC found some people who were crossing and they started to film them and like asking questions like live recording of this, you know, live, like a live interview. And, um, you know, you could see those people who are going to have difficulty, you know, in, in the water there, you know, in terms of the, in, in the boat. And I just thought it was, it was, it was like a spectacle. Like a you know like a circus like a TV show like a re like a reality TV show. Yeah, with a yes, Kevin Carter with 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 a vulture. I'll... No, 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 no. I'm I'm listening to you. I'm going to try to uh, um, find you the um, the link. Uh... Yes, of course, you can keep going. Um, uh, read the Orientalism Edward side and everything, uh, we, we realized travel blogs um, uh, never depicts um, uh, the uh, some countries uh, with the humans on the picture. 
they just rather uh, depict all those um, uh, cities without human. So I just wonder uh, your um, uh, your views uh, about it, and thank you very much. I unmute uh, unmute myself now. Do you want me to answer it? Evet, buyurun. Zaten şu an tek e, konuğumuz sizsiniz. Evet. Lütfen dinliyoruz evet. Oh, okay, right. Okay. So yeah, I think it's I think it's I I think you know what it is 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 that we are uh I'm trying I'm trying to say the right words. Um the idea of the other in inverted commas, you know, um has always been prominent. I mean, whether it's uh, Turkey or India or any other country that's not Anglo-Saxon, uh, if you look at the mythologies that are used, now if you look at, let's say this, let's, let's look at Scandinavia. Uh, we look at, the, you know, it, it, there's a positivity on the kind of visual imagery from Scandinavia. It's, you know, it's clean, it's, uh, stylish but also its mythology of the vikings is, is 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 something upheld in a real kind of way whereas if we look at something like uh mongol the, Mo the mongols or if we look at the ottomans or uh you know it, it's, it's always been shown in a negative light because it's it it, it 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 you build these mythologies and these histories where uh the other is always seen as, as as the enemy and you only ever romanticize the places so let's say with india with india I, i'll speak from my my experience of india because of, of my heritage okay so very recently they had a tv show here called a suitable boy it's by a very famous author called vikram seth who done this very amazing book the it was run on, I think, the BBC that done the, done the show, but it was all very beautifully filmed, but it was nostalgic of that time just after partition of the idea of India. And it, it, was, it didn't show any kind of reality to it. And also, when you look at kind of the idea of how India is portrayed, on the one hand, we have this kind of romanticism of, of the subcontinent, and then you also have a degradation of the continent, but you never talk about actually the country moving on quite a lot. And don't get me wrong, I'm no fan of uh, Hindu nationalism. I, you know, I, I'm no fan of Modi. You know, he, you know, he, he's a, uh, he's as, he, he's as bad as Trump, if not worse. Um, but when we talk about kind of the idea of visual imagery and how it is used, whether it's moving imagery or whether it's photographs. Um, even words, uh, the, yeah, there is this idea that's always transplanted of either a patronizing kind of uh, mo mother or father over, over these countries and, and, and civilizations, ignoring um, centuries and centuries of, of culture and, 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 and just saying that we came there, we civilized people. And it's, when, when you look at it, it's actually, pretty disgusting you know in, 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 in what they do but what it does do is that it it it, it, it allows the brainwashing and controlling if it, i don't want to maybe brainwashing is too strong a word but it reinforces the indigenous population of the uk or the west where that they have a of upper hand that we are civilized we know about the world etc 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 if we look at the idea of Turkey, um, regardless of who's in power in Turkey, look, look at look 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 what happened in Germany. You know, how many Turk, how many Turkish citizens were there, or Turkish people who weren't allowed to become German citizens? Look at um, the stories I think are, are told about those things. Look at what the, what they did in Brexit and in, in in the European Union. But this is because we are talking about the idea of fear that's uh, put into the in, in, into the population of these countries because they, they, they fear that they're going to come and take over take our jobs because it if it, it, it forms a very handy narrative to kind of uh, cover up the problems of the country itself 
you know, the, whatever problems the UK has, uh, and Brexit really was about immigrants, about brown people. And if if we'd remained in the UK, if the, the UK had remained in um, in Europe, the, the the Turkish community would have come there. Now, if you talk about the, if, if, if you go full circle about the visual imagery used, they did a poster of refugees who are coming from Turkey or in Turkey, and they said these are going to be the Turkish community coming over. So look how strong that image was. And even and, and so this is the problem. The photographer was like my news photographer. And he was he was a photographer, he was a staff photographer for Getty. That goes into a library for Getty, and then Getty to make money sells the picture wherever they need to sell it because it's a business. And they sold it to the, the to, to the vote leave campaign, which was then used for advertising. Uh, you know, and the photographer, the, the photographer had no say in it. He, he was he was under contract to the organization. You know, so it's I just think, you know, literally it is um, it's a power play, you know, and people are talking about it more and more. But whether the powers that be change anything, I don't you know, I can't see it. That's, that's why I go back to previously about having trying to empower ourselves and 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 that if we can empower ourselves then the then the people we talk to in power might listen so the ngos you know 20 years ago ngos would never have talked about the idea of consent of how photographs are made what do you have you know uh, if you go into a refugee camp how you conduct yourself who takes you around the conversations that you have you know um I don't know. I don't know if that answers your question, Tule. Oh, thank you, Atul. Mm-hmm. 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 Like the emphasis is on how many of them suffering from this system. Mm-hmm. So in case you would have a situation that you need to take a photograph, but the main purpose of the photograph is to tell how many of the people are suffering from it. Would you still go with the individualized version that we have been mm-hmm. talking about as, a, as an alternative? Or would you try something else? I just wondered, this is a case-based question. I think it's really important that you ask that question. So on a personal level, I don't work in that way anymore. Um, and, I, and I think if, if, I was to do a, if I was to do a story regarding uh, uh, that particular issue in Bangladesh, I'd try to approach it in a different way. And I, I don't know if I could, but the thing is that the, 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 this is the contradiction I'm, I'm talking about. So if you're a news photographer, uh, and even if you're an art photographer even, I don't, you know, you, sometimes an image like that will show everything perfectly as it should. It, you know, it, it will be a powerful photograph for that actual subject. And it's difficult because there might be no other way of doing that visually as a kind of photograph. You might do portraits of individual workers and their testimonies might be told, but a big photograph might show it better. And that's, and there, that's, that's the, where we, we're, we're stuck with this uh, situation whereby 
how do we tell these stories? Because, you know, um, I, I, I think, I think the biggest issue is is is, is really about um, being very 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 astute and careful about which which line you cross, and I mean that in a sense of um, if you take a photograph of an individual or a situation that is a tragedy or something that's happening, um, it might be valid, but how? But how? How many times can you take the same photograph? How? How many times can you repeat the same pattern? You see. So the thing is. So with with let's say the example you you're talking about, that image might come up maybe once a year. In a story, okay. If you have a, if you have a, the situation with the, with, with with uh, with people seeking refuge, and 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 it's an ongoing situation, and and what what you do is you all you see is every day these pictures reiterated. It's the same thing used over and over. What I think that's the, that's what does that what what, what does that put in people's minds? Does that kind of make sense? I, I mean, it's a difficult one because the thing is that you know I think. I think it's valid, and I think, like I said, I think that that's the that's the most difficult thing for a photographer. If you're a news photographer, it's going to be in front of you, and you may have the best will in the world to to, to show that, and and maybe it'll, it will work a few times, but if you are then continually using that same trope or narrative constantly, um, I think then it becomes it becomes difficult difficult because. You know, we, we've seen the idea of garment workers in Bangladesh used over and over and over again for that example, and nothing really changes. They're just shamed into kind of like doing something. So I just, I mean, I don't know, Neil. It's it, it's a hard one. But for me personally, I I don't I don't work in that way anymore. It's a, you know, and I, and I don't and I'm not saying that another photographer shouldn't. That's the, I think that's their choice, but. I think you have to really ask yourself the question of where is this going to be used and how is it going to be used? Um, I don't know. It's a hard one. No, thank you. I like from I what you said, I got that the combination of it when we have to yeah. would be like the ideal. I it's, guess. Um, you know, uh, I, when I was in Sicily, I, had to, I, I, I was photographing the sea, just the sea by itself. And um, even that is problematic because everybody's shooting that because the people, are trying, people are trying to think about, no, I, mean, problem, not, I don't mean problematic shooting it because of what we do. I mean problematic visually because the problem is that I think people who care about visual imagery and how, how, how pictures are used, we are all looking for different ways of telling the story. So something then becomes a cliche. You see, it becomes a cliche. So how many times do how many photographers or artists photograph this thing? So my friend done a, a drone video of the route of the sea, right? She runs a, as a video installation. I done a photograph of the sea. Somebody done a photograph of the sea from a different angle. So even then you're kind of regurgitating. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very, very difficult fine line. And also I think it's also part of this is about the um, kudos value of the artist. If you have an artist or a photographer who is highly respected, it, it can change the, the way things are. So like I said, Al Weiwei, you know, he done his project, what he was doing, you know, people were standing up and looking and listening. You know, um, if I did the same thing, I don't know if I said, mean, you know, I'm trying to get people to go look at the work. I don't know if I would not have the same reaction, but you know, um, we continue. I think that's the only thing we can do, but we continue, we can we, we challenge ourselves, you know? Are you a photographer then? Oh, I gotta get the Me? door, yeah. A new one, yes. <laughs> Bear with me one minute. I got to answer my front door.
Arada başka soru oh, sorulan sorry. var mı? Ben buradan göremiyorum. I do not see any further questions. Elçin, the chat box is empty. I do not see any further questions. Neither can I. Um, uh, we beg your pardon, our apologies. Uh, we haven't been able to establish a proper connection. Uh, this has been most unfortunate. Um, apparently, there is a disconnection in Mardin, and he couldn't find any alternative. So we couldn't really listen to him. But um, that was the unfortunate uh, thing that happened today. Yes, that 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 was really unfortunate. Yeah, I feel alone because I think um, it's been really fascinating to hear his his point of view. But also, I we were talking earlier about um, the power of empowerment, but also the power of kind of therapy for 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 these children using using the medium of photography. You know, to tell their stories. I think you know that physical act of being able to take a photograph and then take it through to its fruition. And it's not a digital photograph, but, but the actual physicality of taking the photograph, processing it, printing it, seeing their life uh, come alive in these photographs that they themselves have made and can tell these stories. I mean, I came across Circus's work because um, a magazine here published a piece on, on, on what he was doing. And, and the magazine that was using it was actually more a fashion magazine. It wasn't even a news magazine. And I thought that was very interesting that we had a, a, a magazine which was much more towards making money economically through fashion and lifestyle was letting people see that here was this artist, young man working with, 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 with children and empowering them and using therapy. And changing the, the the dynamic of of how we how we look at look 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 at children or look at people in distress. Well, actually, in Turkey, we have implemented this time and time again within the Photography Foundation. We have some colleagues. And they have been focusing on catastrophes such as earthquakes, not just warfare, but um, uh, unexpected traumas, uh, natural disasters, flooding, and obviously immigration and warfare. It's such um, situations they have um, done this, uh, done something similar. They got on a truck, something like a truck, and um, they went to these regions and um, they tried to. Um, um, get people to take photographs, of course, depending on the environment, depending on the physical conditions, but uh, they did similar projects. They reached out to children so that they could photograph what they were going through. So there have been such projects in mm. Turkey as well. And I, I, agree with, I, I agree with you, Kalpesh. This has a, a few um, implications. First of all, children get lost in the moment. It's as if uh, you know they have this magic tool they develop the uh, photo, they, they um, frame the, the shot. So it does seem magical to children. So in a way, it, it, it sort of soothes them. But on the other hand, on the other hand, um, like we discussed this evening, um, we deconstruct the images um, devised by the mainstream media and we get down to the bottom of things in the day-to-day -day life. Uh, people who are depicted as victims are empowered in this photograph and they tell a story as to what their lives are like. So that's that's uh, quite interesting as well. Uh, one of my students uh, worked with Syrian children and their biggest complaint was the fact that um, as they were playing with other kids, um, you know, uh, in the neighborhood, they were not able to play the games that they used to play in Syria. They didn't care about not being able to go to school. But they didn't like the fact that, um, you know, they, they couldn't really play um, the games they played in Syria with Turkish kids. So um, these things are important. They are looked down upon, but they make up um, the majority of people's day to day lives. So we need to see that uh, in those photographs, because what you see in the me me mainstream media um, do not give you any clue as to these things. Let us continue. Well, I believe 
Uh, Chin shared the news articles about Sirkane. Yes, we have answered all the questions. I believe there is no other comment or answer uh, or question. And actually, we have come towards the end of our time. So if you like, you could wrap up, unless there's someone who would like to take the floor. Is there anyone? Is there any question? OK, then, thank you very much, Kaapish Latiga, for uh, giving your time, for allocating your time for us. No, 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 Sorry, thank you. Salih was unfortunately uh, not here. Uh, thank you very much for your participation. I hope that um, this has been fruitful. This is uh, an ongoing process. This process has to uh, keep going, uh, keep producing, keep changing. We need to find examples that break this framework, this stereotype. So I will give the floor to Alci now if she has anything to add. Thank you very much, Kamze. Thank you very much, Kalpesh. Unfortunately, we weren't able to hear uh, Sarbest's work, but what he does is quite interesting, quite enjoyable as well. I hope that in another panel, we will have the opportunity of uh, hearing him. I would like to thank our interpreters as well, and I would like to thank all participants for being here, for asking their questions. And I wish you all a good evening. Good evening. All right. Can I say, can you hear me? I just want to say thank you to everybody for coming. It's been a real pleasure seeing all of you. I, um, I, feel, I feel blessed. And, um, you know, I, I hope to see all of you in Turkey February, if I get over. <laughs> also to take care. And, and, and um, to the interpreters, thank you so much for being amazing. Like, and I, and I apologize to all you Turkish speakers. I'm just useless, but... You made it very easy for me. Have a very good day. Stay safe and healthy. Thank you for your nice words.